It really is my pleasure to be here and um, see so many uh, familiar faces, new friends, old friends, and I am sorry that I'm only going to be able to be here for this morning and need to leave this afternoon. Um, so um, unlike Lou, I'm not here to ask for money. I'm, um, uh, I, 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 I was asked to talk about um, how we approach um, children uh, with neuroblastoma, especially relapsed or refractory neuroblastoma at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And, and um, as Lou was going through his talk, I had my talk open and I deleted a lot of slides that, that would have been redundant uh, with what uh, Lou was saying. So what I really hope to do today is um, not so much talk to you about what we've done in the past is where we're heading and, and I'd like to present to you um, a couple of ideas of how we're, we're thinking of trying to change change things in, in uh, the sad reality right now of having very limited options for children with relapsed neuroblastoma. So I'm going to go through the motivation for our work, what our mindset is, and then present some data um, and uh, a couple of clinical trial concepts that uh, we hope to have open in the next year or so. So the motivation, I don't need to tell this audience about the motivation, but these are two children who uh, were both referred to me um, for ALK mutated uh, refractory neuroblastoma. And um, uh, Lou talked about ALK, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, that this is a gene that we found to be mutated um, and is something we can do about. And so the child on the left, obviously, is, is a very sad situation, and um, there was really nothing that we could offer that child. Um, it took a long time to get the genetic testing done. Lou talked about this. Um, by the time the genetic testing was actually done, there was really nothing we could do. Um, the girl on the right, however, was, was not quite as sick as the boy on the left, but she was also in pretty bad shape when she got to us. But that was three years ago, and this is a picture of her just this past summer, and she has a form of ALK mutation where it's not just in the tumor, but it's also in every cell in her body. She inherited a predisposition to neuroblastoma. And so she's been on this drug, she calls it her special juice, and she's been on this drug for three years and is in remission, and we certainly hope will stay in remission. So clearly this is what motivates what we do. Um, these are anecdotes, but I think is, is sort of summarizes, um, you know, the goal of our work. The other motivation, and, and Donna and Lou both talked about this, is um, high-risk neuroblastoma therapy is very complicated. It's built over uh, decades of experience, but it doesn't work very well. And, and you sort of saw the curves and the slides, and I'm not going to go through this. Uh, all of you know this better than I, that it's an incredibly toxic therapy. Um, yes, I mean, we've gotten here, and it, it is um, um, what we have, but um, personalized medicine or precision medicine is not going to replace this, but certainly we hope that if we integrate smarter therapies with this current therapy that will at least be able to dial down the toxicity. And then the other sad fact is, is if you go through all of this, the chemotherapy, the uh, uh, immunotherapy, the transplant, and a child suffers a relapse, um, the chance of curing, and I think you guys are all familiar with what these curves mean, that uh, when you see a curve like this that goes to near zero, that's um, that's the sad reality of relapsed neuroblastoma and something that we're desperate to change. So our mindset, um, and I think this is for all the investigators that are here talking to you today, is that um, you, know, you can do plenty of experiments in, in, in the laboratory, but the children uh, that we see have the answers, right? This is this, this motivating force that has driven my work all along, that the children um, in, in, in their genes and the genetics of their tumor, um, they have the answers. And so what we drives us and drives our laboratory is trying to unlock that mystery. And that's why in our laboratory, a lot of the children that we care for, their pictures are there and it really motivates uh, the people in the laboratory. Um, the uh, translational research spectrum, I think you've heard about this, that uh, this idea of discovery and then doing work in the laboratory and then getting it to the clinic. It really starts in the clinic and then goes back to the laboratory. And so we have the um, uh, strong belief that, that before you take any, any drug to a clinical trial, 
you need a lot of proof in the laboratory that, it, that it's a strategy. And we think that that is especially true in childhood cancer. So we won't conceive of a clinical trial until we're pretty darn sure that it's something that's going to work in kids. And um, we have to do all this within the context of maximizing chances for cure, extending life with quality at a minimum, and respecting the dignity of the patient and the child. So there's a lot of things that we could do in the clinic, right? There's a lot of different drugs out there, there's a lot of things we could do, but we have to get things to the clinic when they're ready and we can design a trial that is both safe and has a high, high degree of uh, likelihood to be successful. So Lou showed this slide, um, and I just will spend a minute on it because uh, it is a complicated slide, and uh, try to make two, two points from it. Um, this is showing in each um, column is, a, is an individual neuroblastoma patient's tumor. So there's 240 different tumors that were analyzed. And that plot on the top, the gray bars, that shows the number of mutations in each of the tumor cells. And so there's a varying amount of number of mutations. But as Lou said, relatively low compared to adult cancers. And that's important because adult cancers have a lot more noise, a lot more um, influence of the environment causing mutations that are random and probably don't mean anything. So this to us says that, as Lou said, that the mutations that do, do occur are going to be drivers, are going to really make a difference in, in something that we can target. Now these are, are the genes that are recurrently mutated, and there's two points from this. One is that there are things like ALK and ATRX that are mutated in a subset of children, but there's a lot of children where we don't see anything, at least with, the, with what we can tell right now. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about ALK because this was our first signal and our first hit, and I think we've made a lot of progress with it. Um, but I also want to emphasize the point that all of the work that we've done is at the time of diagnosis. And as I'll show you a little bit later in this talk, um, when, you, when a child with, with uh, neuroblastoma gets chemotherapy, radiation therapy, et cetera, the tumor changes dramatically. And so these snapshots really don't matter when you get to phase one therapies. The, the tumor changes dramatically. And one of the major points that I'm going to try to leave you with is that we really don't know what drugs are best for relapse because we don't get biopsies at the time of relapse. And so a big part of, of the change in mindset, in my opinion, is, is getting those biopsies at the time of relapse. So you've heard a lot about this gene already. Um, it's, it's a protein. It's what we're looking for when we're talking about drug targets. It's a protein that's on the surface of cells. It's critically important for the process of, of the develop, during normal development for getting a nerve cell to turn into what neuroblastoma comes from, an an autonomic nerve. It's critically important for that. So it's essential to the, the, it's hardwired in neuroblastoma. And as I said, it was really credentialed in us understanding that it should be important because when you're born with a mutation in this gene, you can develop neuroblastoma. In fact, you, you're very likely to develop neuroblastoma. Now, that's thankfully rare, but we have um, a way to now screen for that and to, and to surveil for um, uh, uh, neuroblastoma in patients who have a germline mutation, but thankfully that's very rare. So this is uh, what we think is a good target, and as Lou already mentioned, we showed many years ago that there are mutations in this gene that, that turn it on. So in other words, this gene is, is normally on during a, a, a particular phase of the development, but by the time the child's born, it's turned off. In, in neuroblastoma, this gets stuck on, which tells the cell that it wants to continue to divide. So this is exactly what we want when we're thinking about a, uh, a drug target. So work that I almost say did many years ago showed that in some models, so these are, um, you know, what we do after we have these discoveries, we model this in the laboratory, and so this is growing tumors in mice, and um, this is a particular cell line that has a particular mutation, and you can see that if you don't, if you give uh, a placebo or nothing at all, the tumor grows very quickly, but if you give the, this drug crizotinib, um, you can shrink it and make it go away and make it stay away. However, 
a different cell line with a different mutation, you can slow it down a little bit or maybe not at all. And so one of the major things that we learned, and this is what I was talking about, is the importance of doing this work um, in the laboratory before you go to the clinic, is that we knew we had a problem here before we went to the clinic, that all these ALK mutations were not created equal, and that we had to a, had a think differently, not just based upon the binary ALK is mutated, yes or no, but what is the type of mutation? And we tried very, very hard to get around this in the clinic by escalating the doses so that we could deal with these resistance mutations. So, and I th what I think is still one of the um, most rapid translations of a discovery to a clinical trial, Yael um, and, and colleagues got a clinical trial open um, uh, to investigate crizotinib in, in, in neuroblastoma, as well as other pediatric cancers where there are um, ALK changes. As Lou mentioned, that the ALK is not limited to neuroblastoma. It's mutated in a different fashion in some other cancers. And, you know, this drug crizotinib is a, um, is a great drug if you have anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So all of these black spots in the neck and the chest are active lymphoma at the time uh, after a transplant, and this child was um, uh, at the end of her life uh, when referred for crizotinib. And after 28 days of this pill, this, uh, all, of the, all of the lymphoma is gone, and this child's in remission you know, several years later just on this single agent crizotinib. It works very well in a sarcoma where there's a translocation, um, and there are absolute signs of, of activity in neuroblastoma, the sensitive mutation making this, this mass go away. Um, uh, after just two cycles of this drug, and as I showed you the picture of Edie in the beginning, the girl on the right, there are clear signs of activity. However, because of the problem of these resistance mutations, it doesn't work all the time, and it's clearly not the home run that, it, that um, drugs for um, Philadelphia chromosome positive CML uh, or ALL has been. Um, but in my very strong opinion, it's not that ALK or the targets wrong, it's that we don't have the right drug. And I'll show you something about that in just one second. So where we are right now with ALK inhibition str uh, strategies is that um, a lot of work that I'm not showing you is that if you getting back into how we're thinking of the future and how these strategies are going to integrate with what we're already doing, there are data that show that this, this therapy, when combined with chemotherapy, is very effective. And the next uh, children's oncology group study, uh, phase three study, will have crizotinib uh, integrated into chemotherapy for children whose tumor have a, an ALK mutation at diagnosis. Um, as I already said, the, the huge problem is that the drugs that are really good for lung cancer and lymphoma and, and those sorts of diseases are not good neuroblastoma drugs. And, and that's why there's been a huge amount of work in developing and testing other drugs. And so this is, um, this is a cancer cell line that was actually derived from a, a UK patient who came to see us um, um, at, at the end of his life. We were, uh, he, this is one of these resistant uh, uh, mutations. Uh, Crizotinib does not work very well. This is the tumor taken out and then passage and grown in, in mice. And you can see that crizotinib could slow it down but you could see that that doesn't really work very well. But this new drug developed by a pharmaceutical company, Pfizer, works extremely, extremely well. And this is a drug that we're going to rush to clinical trial and hopefully in collaboration with Lou and others on this side of the, uh, the Atlantic and hopefully Asia um, uh, because we're very excited about this compound. So I'd like to talk about, um, so ALK. It's, 10%, maybe 14% of newly diagnosed neuroblastomas. That's important for that group of patients. But I made the comment earlier on that um, we don't really know much about mutations at, at um, relapse. In the children's oncology group, we've had a very nice program to collect tumor samples. We've been doing it for years. Um, we have a little over 5,000 neuroblastomas in our tumor bank. When we did a survey of how many of those were at diagnosis and how many of them were at relapse, only 15 
we only had 15 in the bank for relapse. And that's a, real, a huge problem, right? Because as I already said, um, when a child shows up for, uh, um, when a child suffers a relapse, it's after a long history of, of drugs that we know mutate the genome and change it. So this was a collaboration, this is a collaboration with uh, the Dutch and the French, and where we just collected any of the relapsed neuroblastomas we had. And this, again, a complicated slide, but it, it's pretty simple, actually. So each set of bar graphs is from a single patient at diagnosis, and then at relapse. And what's in this hatched part are the number of mutations that were identical in the diagnostic sample and the relapse sample. And what's in green are mutations that were in the diagnostic sample that were no longer present at the time of relapse. And what's in red are all new mutations. And so you can see that as you look across these individual patients, there's some pretty striking diversity, and there's some where very few of the original mutations survived. And this is really important for two reasons. One, ALK that we know about um, is much, much more frequent at, at relapse. So we, we, we don't have a lot of numbers, but we estimate as high as 40 percent of relapse tumors will have an ALK mutation. So that's very different than the 10 or 15 percent. And the other very important thing is, and I'm not showing you any of the primary data, is that there's this ALK, the way that it feeds a cell and tells it to grow is through something called the RAS pathway. Um, and when you look across these 25 cases, about two-thirds of them had mutations in that pathway. And they were, this may be getting into a little bit too much detail, they were mutually exclusive. So if you have an ALK mutation, then you didn't have a mutation elsewhere, but if you had a mutation further down the road, you didn't have an ALK mutation. This is, this is a way that we sort of assess that these are really important in driving the tumor. So this um, um, uh, has led to uh, a concept of a clinical trial that I'll show you in just a second. The other very important thing, um, we've talked a lot about getting precision medicine, getting these drugs to the clinic. Um, we, we learned a long time ago that single agents don't cure cancer, no matter how good they are. So ALK inhibitors are great, but if you just use that single drug, a cancer cell is going to figure out a way around it. And so the, the other sort of um, thing that we very much focus on at our laboratory is when we have these signals, that what is, this, what is the smartest that we can figure out in the laboratory combination strategy? And so just a couple of, an example, of examples here. Um, one of the common mutations in those patients with relapses is, is getting rid of a gene called NF1. And, and it's not important to know what that is other than it helps drive that ALK-RAS pathway. And so the, the type of work we do in the lab, and this is just an example, is this drug inhibits something called CDK4 that Lou mentioned. This drug him, inhibits something called MEK. But the combination of the drug works much better, but only in, only in the uh, in the models that we have that have mutations in this line, in this pathway. And so if you were to do this combination in a different cancer cell line where there wasn't a mutation, none of these things would work. And so uh, again, this is uh, just an example, and I'll give you one more example of how combination therapies are tested in the laboratory. This is, uh, um, again, uh, this is an ALK inhibitor, and this is a so-called CDK4-6 inhibitor, same one as the previous slide. And this is just looking at different doses, knowing that while mice are not little humans, we can very precisely look at doses that are achievable in children and compare them to doses we know we can get in mice, and so that we can do these dose-finding things so that when we go to the clinic, we can come in with a dose that we hope will be effective and, and we know is achievable in patients. And so these are, the, these are the examples of the sort of things that we do in the lab. So to wrap up uh, the last few slides, I, I just want to talk about um, we think the time is now to do a, um, a so-called master protocol uh, in neuroblastoma, and I'll, I'll explain what that is. This title's a little bit complicated, but what we envision is, back to this adage that the, the patients have the answer, that in order to do this right, we need to get tumor tissue at the time of the child starting the trial. 
And so there are several things that you need to have in place in order to justify that ethically. And so we think that there are a sufficient number of things in the tumor cell, a so-called biomarker, a genetic change that we can measure, and then we know how to match with, with a drug or a drug combination. We think that there is equipoise amongst the parents and, and the physicians, that, that there's the potential of benefit by doing this. Um, we think that there is a sufficient interest in, in industry. Uh, what we're talking about here is, is a little bit of a out of the box for most uh, uh, drug companies and in, in, in combining different drugs together within a single clinical trial. Um, and we think that we've worked pretty hard, this isn't just a CHOP, but we've worked pretty hard at CHOP to develop the infrastructure to do this. And I'll just give you one example of how this, you know, what has to happen. So this is, this is the type of child that we're talking about. So this is her fifth relapse, and it's just this lesion here in, in the thigh, right? So surveillance scan, she feels fine, but we know we have a problem. So we've worked very hard with our interventional radiologists to be able to get at that safely in an outpatient procedure. And we've worked very hard with our pathologist um, out of all this smush in, 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 in this biopsy, this is the only piece of neuroblastoma that was in there. And, and so we have worked out the technology to be able to get that and get a result, to get this sort of genetic information that this tumor had a lesion in this gene, and that gene, we think, matches to a certain drug that we have that will be in this clinical trial. So uh, second to last slide. We have a trial that we will be opening at CHOP hopefully in, in February or March of 2015. Um, there's been a little bit of a complication with one of the drugs, but uh, um, uh, it's moving forward. So we call this the Next Generation Personalized Neuroblastoma Therapy. Kind of fits nice with the title of the conference, I guess. Um, the acronym uh, is Nepenthe, which is, a, is a, um, an old Greek term for a, a drug to take away pain and suffering. Um, so we thought it was appropriate. And this, this trial will have four different drugs, and they're, they're listed here. Two different drug companies. To get two different drug companies to, to do this together was a little bit of a challenge. But as, as we said, the, the concept of this trial is when a child has suffered a relapse, they would get a biopsy. There's a whole bunch of research that will happen on that biopsy sample, but there'll be a, um, a sequencing done and then the children will be uh, stratified to one of three different treatments. This is not a randomized trial. They're, they're stratified to one of three treatments based upon what the genetics say. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but if you have any one of these, but not the thing in red, then you would get this combination. If you have any of these, but not the thing in red, you get this combination. And then very importantly, because we don't have a match for everything, and there are some patients where there just won't be any genetic finding, we have what we call an unmatched arm. And so these are for patients, our estimates are about 30% will match here, about 30% will match here, and for the rest, they will get a, a drug that activates a, a gene called P53. Um, there's a lot of work in the lab that I didn't go through that shows this, this drug, HDM201, um, is a, um, uh, a very effective agent uh, in neuroblastoma through this P53 mechanism. Most patients we find have, uh, are eligible because they don't have a mutation in that gene. And this is a little bit challenging because this drug is just in phase one in adults, so we have the agreement to do our, this will be a single agent phase one at one dose level behind the adult phase one. So we're gonna stay coordinated with them and this, again, I think a little bit of a paradigm shift to actually go into kids before there's an adult uh, MTD um, or adult dose. So um, this is at the FDA, and hopefully we'll have it open uh, soon. And I think that this will go in a long way in, in helping answer the question that Lou was asking is, does all this matter, right? I mean, we can, we can do all this, but is it going to make an impact in, in the clinic? And the last thing I want to say, and it's not ready for prime time, but uh, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we're leading an effort through um, something called Stand Up to Cancer, and it's being supported by the St. Baldrick's Foundation, um, 
to discover new immune therapeutic targets. I'm not going to talk about any of this today. You're going to hear a lot more from Holger and, uh, and Alice about immuno immunotherapy. But we've known a long time about GD2. Um, but the surface of a neuroblastoma cell is pretty complex. And there are many things beyond GD2 that could be targeted. And the only thing I'll just show you today is that everything that is circled here has recently been credentialed as a potential neuroblastoma immunotherapeutic target through this Stand Up to Cancer St. Baldrick's effort. And uh, several things. There are new immunotherapy is against ALK, um, against NCAM, um, against CD276 that are in various phases of uh, preclinical or clinical development. So there's a lot coming down the pipe, pipeline. So I just want to end by saying that I, I do, I'm a believer that, that, that um, we're going to change how we do uh, relapse therapy and then hopefully uh, therapy at diagnosis and that, that it will, will be based upon uh, the genetics of the patient and the genomics of the tumor. Um, uh, Donna asked me what is the difference between genetics and genomics, and, and they're really, <laughs> it, genetics is, I think of as what's in the body, every cell in the body, and genomics is what's in the tumor. That's not a precise definition, but that's how we use it anyways. Um, and the whole goal of this is that we can develop curative therapies that are safer um, and, and more rational. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.